Hi, it's Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. I'm back with more real bargains. If you haven't found the real bargains at your thrift store, your yard sale, flea markets, anywhere around antique stores, antique malls, it's your own fault. I wanna help you learn it, find it, sell it, make money. Ugh, it's all right here. Okay, here's what we've got. First real bargain, all the people who I'm retelling these stories have given me permission to retell these stories, not going to use any of their names. This is the first piece right out of the chute, the Peter Moore designed 1985 Michael Jordan sneakers. If you don't know about sneaker culture, you're not living in the world today. Sneakers are huge. They're so big. Sneaker culture. Lots of people are looking for the vintage pieces, and they're looking for those particular sneakers that were worn by the great athletes of the time. Michael Jordan, of course, great athlete. So a couple of things that you want to look for with these. These were purchased for $50 in the box now in the box never been worn the original swoosh here with the air jordan wings logo on them never been worn in the original box so that's mint and package you've heard it mip mint and package that's what you're looking for these particular 1985 sneakers have been held by uh, one of the people who I met at a virtual event. I was doing a virtual antique appraisal event with a large group, and he had these for the virtual event. He said his wife bought them, and she bought them because she figured, hey, you know, for 50 bucks, how could I lose? She couldn't lose. They're worth $50,000 for a $50 investment. Wonderful example of real bargains, and I'm showing you all of them right here. I'm showing you how to identify them, how to find them, how to resell them. Stick with this channel. This is where you're going to find it. Our next real bargain, of course, is another great real bargain found at a thrift store. This one came in through an online appraisal that someone sent me. You know, you send a photo through my website and I look at them, and this particular one was a real bargain too. So this one is a painting, and I always tell you that art has big margins. So if you can look at the art and consider the art, it's a good idea. Why? What does it mean, big margins? You can buy it really low at the thrift stores, antique stores, and of course, even at the yard sales and estate sales, and then you can resell them online for a lot more money or resell them to collectors for a lot more money, and I'll show you how right here on the channel. Okay, and you gotta share the channel. You have to share it and tell everybody because the more the channel gets shared, the more information, the more ideas that I can, of course, help you with. But you got to share the channel. I can't help you if you don't help me. Anyway, this is a great story. So this person, she's walking around her thrift store. It was a Goodwill store, and she sees that she's going to check out. She's bought all of her stuff. She did not have this painting in her cart yet. So she doesn't have the painting in the cart, and she says, well, you know what, I'm going up to the cashier, I'm ready to go. She sees a woman in front of her who has all of these things that are breakable that have to be wrapped. So she figures, oh, this is gonna take a while. And that would be like me. I'd be like, oh, who, how long is this woman gonna take? You know, so she said, I'm gonna go around the store again while these people are getting finished. So she's more, more patient than I would be. I would be like, just take me now. I only have a couple of things. They're not all breakables, but of course you can't just go ahead in the line and okay, all right. Anyway, so she has the piece. She decides that she's going to step out of line, let this person finish, of course, her checking out with the cashier. And she makes another loop around the store. As she makes another loop around the the thrift store, the Goodwill, she actually sees this painting and she says, well, you know, it's kind of good looking. I kind of like it. She turns it over and she told me during a video call, she said to me, wow, Dr. Lori, it's interesting because I turned it over and then I saw all the information on the back. She saw a label for the artist's gallery. The artist's name is Albert Kramer, an Ohio-based artist who makes his mark really in Los Angeles. So sees the mark on the back, the label on the back that's from the Kramer Gallery, sees that the name of the piece, which is Angel's Flight, sees, of course, the date, which is 1968. All the information is right there. All you have to do is see it, look at it, read it. So she sees this piece, oil on canvas. It's characteristic of the artist's style of, of course, this little scene in a city with the funicular, you know, the Angel's Flight, this kind of thing. And it's really indicative of what the artist typically did in the late 1960s. She pays $12 for it. So she asks me, sends me a photo, asks me, you know, can you do an online appraisal? Can you do an re appraisal report for it? I researched the piece and guess what? It's worth $3,000 in the original frame from the artist with the original gallery label. That's w a wonderful real bargain. This next real bargain also comes from Goodwill, but this Goodwill piece is on the floor, on the floor. 
two lamps, alabaster lamps. They light at the top with the bulb and they light in the bottom, in the base, in fact, too. So they're really kind of cool. They are very, very heavy. She finds them on the floor. So I meet this person during a video call. And you know all about my video calls. You can call up and get appraisals with me directly, talk to me on a video call. So she says, I walked through the aisle and I almost kicked them because they were on the floor. She goes, I tried to pick them up and they were so heavy. So they were too heavy for her to actually pick up. So she calls her husband, her husband comes over and he picks them up, puts them in the, in the cart. And she says, well, I have to get them now. So she pays $25 for them. They are, of course, mid 20th century. You know about lamps. Look for the marks, look for the sets, and don't overlook lamps. A lot of people will resell lamps and a lot of people don't know what they're doing when they're reselling them because it can be a little bit difficult to identify the proper material. Don't worry if you have to have a lamp rewired. That's typically you. That's typically worth it to have the lamp rewired. Uh, so don't worry about that. That doesn't negatively impact value. Oh, if I don't have the 1920s plug, you know, okay. If you want to rewire it, you can, but you want to make sure that you keep the 1920s plug. But don't plug in the 1920s plug, you know, unless you you know, live pretty close to the fire company. I've told you that before. Anyway, these particular lamps are in very good condition. They were not rewired. They had the original wiring and she paid $25 for them. They're worth 300 each. Yeah, they're really valuable lamps. Other lamps that are really valuable, similar types, uh, sometimes the glass lamps. You'll also see those mid-century modern 1950s, 1960s lamps are pretty valuable, but lamps are really a hot ticket mainly because of staging. A lot of people will sell them to stagers, you know, the, in the real estate realm. A lot of people will also sell them to interior designers or straight out on eBay, Etsy, Ruby Lane, and other places. So you want to look for that too when you're trying to resell your pieces. That was a fun video call. This next real bargain was really a research project. And it was funny because my client got in touch with me through an online, sent me a picture of these three plates. Now, you're all recognizing them and you're all saying, ooh, Dr. Lori, those are oyster plates, those are oyster plates. But do you know who made them? They are unmarked. So this is where you need the expertise, you know? And people just say, oh, you know, you could look this up and find it. You really need the expertise on all of these pieces. So as the expert in the field, I want you to learn what I did to, of course, identify these. So you see these three oyster plates, they're very nicely done. You can see that the oysters would sit in this sort of heart-shaped form, this little heart-shaped area. And what's funny about this is like, I grew up in New England. So, you know, no, we very rarely would have oysters in an oyster plate. And people will say, oh, that's unusual. Well, not really, because what we would basically do was it was just, hey, you're having oysters and it was what was happy. So it was good to have clams, clams, casinos, oysters, those kinds of things. But oyster plates were sort of a little bit more elite than my family. So these particular oyster plates became indicative not only of that idea of aphrodisiacs, right? That goes back to, uh, the, to the goddess Venus, the Aphrodite or aphrodisiacs, you know, love. So oysters would do that. But oysters and clams and other shellfish were oftentimes connected on these elite plates. So you had to have beautiful plates in some of these great china patterns like Limoges and Meissen, they would have their own individual oyster plates. So I'm looking at these pieces and my client says to me, she says, well, Dr. Lurie, you know, I don't know who made them, but I got them at the Goodwill and I got them for $1.25 each and I bought three of them. They were just sitting there on the shelf. They were marked with a label, with a sticker, $1.25, and that's what I paid for each of them. So that's $3.75, not even four bucks. Not even four bucks, right, for these three oyster plates. You know where I'm going with this. If you don't know where I'm going with this, then you haven't been watching me enough. So basically what you're looking at here are these three oyster plates. How did I identify them? I looked at the shape of the mold on the back. This is why I always tell you, even if it's unmarked, you have to be able to recognize the actual maker by the mold. Now you're all rolling your eyes going, oh my gosh, you did it by the mold? Yeah, that's why I'm the best, right there. This is a Franz Schmidt German manufactured early 20th century oyster plates. There are others like this, exact same pattern, exact same detailing in different colors with the same mold unmarked. These particular plates, if you look at the shape of that mold on the back, 
That's how I was able to recognize it. And that's how I was able to tell my client that she had oyster plates, all three of them worth 600 bucks that she got for $3.75. It's a beautiful set. They are porcelain, hand painted, hand gilded, gorgeous. That's a real bargain. This next real bargain was a great story too. I was on a video call, I was talking to a client, a nice guy, and he said, you know, I'm in construction, Dr. Lori, and I bought a barn. So, you know, barns are funny to me because my dad loved barn wood. My dad was one of the guys in the workshop downstairs, and he would make barn wood things, cabinets and, and little tables and stuff out of frames, out of barn wood. Barn wood was really big in the 70s and 80s, and it's having a nice revival now with the repurposers and the upcyclers, those folks who have a lot of talent, who can take something that doesn't look like much and make it into a lot. But barn wood was really kind of popular. So when this client of mine said to me, hey, Dr. Lurie, you know, I bought a barn and I bought all the stuff in the barn while I was doing my construction work. So he buys everything in the barn and he pays $1,000 for everything in the barn. That's a pretty typical number for that idea of, hey, you're trying to get rid of something. So the barn he gets, he wanted the barn wood, he wanted all the stuff in the barn and he finds this in the barn. So this particular piece doesn't really go along with barn wood, but it does go along with the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, of course, some of the most important music acts in uh, history are actually on this particular music poster. So you see this music poster, which was, at a, it was a poster for a couple of special dates at Madison Square Garden and in Boston. And it's signed by each of these very famous acts, Billy Joel and Sting, James Taylor. James Taylor is my favorite. I love James Taylor. I met his, I met his um, Carly Simon, his wife of, well, for some time, but Carly Simon's brother. And uh, I met Peter Simon and I, I was begging him. He's a friend of mine, he's a photographer, uh, a very good photographer of rock photography. And I said to Peter, I said, I want to meet James Taylor. I'm coming to Martha's Vineyard. I want to meet James Taylor. And I never got a chance. And anyway, he was busy. But I still want to meet James Taylor and I want to meet Dolly Parton. Don't you want to meet Dolly Parton? Anyway, so these are people I want to meet. But in the music world, Sheryl Crow, Jimmy Buffett, John Cougar Mellencamp, who now is, has been John Mellencamp for a long time, signed this poster. And they all signed this particular poster together. For the $1,000 investment where my client got the barn and everything in it, and this was in it, this particular poster is worth $1,000 for all of the autographs. A beautiful example, all of them are authenticated autographs, which I authenticated. They were all done at the same time. And the only one you have to really kind of look for is Sting because he wrote it the other way. John Cool, John Mellencamp is at the bottom, and then the rest of them are the rest of them are near their own names, uh, Don Henley and the rest. But a great example of music collectibles. It's when two particular categories of collectibles come together. So it's a music collectible, it's a poster collectible, and it's also an autograph collectible, and that becomes important. So while it's not all that old, it is all that valuable. That's a real bargain. This next real bargain comes from the West Coast. It was a video call. And I mentioned that it was the West Coast because when I looked at what this particular client had at the video call he was showing me on video, he said, I got this for about $100, but I got other furniture and other items with it. So he said, so I got a bunch of stuff for about 100 bucks. I said, okay, but when I saw it and when I heard it was on the West Coast, I said, wow, that blanket chest is very far from home. So we go through the video call and I said, can you open up the hinge for me? Can you open it up and so I can see inside? He said, well, what are you looking for inside? I said, well, I always look for dovetails and the different types of dovetailing, which will tell you about the date. I always look for whether or not something's been painted over. And if you look at those black lines, this one had been painted over only in the black line areas, not in the tulip areas or the decorative areas of the flowers. But I also look inside for something called a candle box. These are called mule chests by you know experts like me. People will call them, in fact, blanket chests. And they are for blankets, but they're also for mules. Mules are the slippers. You put these chests at the bottom of the bed, you put blankets in them, and also your slippers or mules and also candles. There's a little box at the side and it has a hinge as well on the interior of these types of blanket chests. And these particular 
chests will have, in fact, something where you can keep candles. The idea in the 18th century or the 1700s was that in the middle of the night when you couldn't see, you could grab a candle, right? You can get your, your slippers and or if you needed a blanket because you were cold, you can add another blanket to the bed. So blanket chests were very important. Blanket chests sometimes seconded, seconded for um, dowry chests, right? So hope chests, like wedding chests. And in that period, it continued this idea that the, the new bride would move into the home of her new husband and his family. So basically what you had here is the blanket chest. Notice this one, which has a date on it of 1704. Why did I mention that this blanket chest was all the way far from home when it was on the West Coast? Because you see those bun feet? Those bun feet at the bottom of that blanket chest indicate to me that it is a Pennsylvania German blanket chest from, of course, the Pennsylvania Germanic um, community. And what's interesting about that is those bun feet, the shape and size of those indicate that they are from Berks County, Pennsylvania, near Reading, Pennsylvania specifically. So I could drill all the way down and tell you where the blanket chest is, even though now the blanket chest is over on the West Coast, Oregon, of course, California area. This particular blanket chest, as I said, he got this and other furniture and other items for $100. It's worth $750. Now, some blanket chests from this time period can be much, much um, more valuable. This one about $750 because of condition. What was beautiful about the condition was also speaking to its history and its background. Notice the tulips. The tulips hope for a wedding that and a union that will have prosperity. And if you notice the other flowers, they relate to loyalty and marriage. So floral symbolism is there too. This Real bargain actually comes from the middle of the United States, and this was a video call. So I'm on a video call with a young man who says, Dr. Laura, you know, I go to thrift stores, I go to yard sales, and I'm doing this sort of as uh, a second job, and I'm doing really well following your channel. I'm following your tips, and I'm making money. I said, I think that's great. He said, I grew up, my mother used to collect silver and silver plate. And silver and silver plate, actually, if you're around it a lot, you can tell a lot about it. You can tell the differences almost immediately. If you smell a piece of sterling, it has a different smell than silver plate. And if you look at silver plate, you can also see the way in which silver plate actually sometimes has a reddish color because it's silver over copper. This particular piece is a wine holder, and it would hold a bottle of wine. You'll notice, of course, the cherubs at the bottom, the figures at the bottom, as well as the grapes. Grapes usually mean wine. So if you see grapes as a motif on something, oftentimes you're dealing with the idea of vineyards or wines, wineries and such. This particular piece is silver plated. And he said by learning and growing up with a lot of silver in his home with his mom, he actually was able to identify this particular piece. So he knew that this piece was silver plate. He saw that sort of coppery color underneath the silver coming through. And I told him that it's English and I told him that it's 19th century, late 19th century piece. Some of these pieces actually had, of course, a, a lock so the top, you couldn't get the top off the wine bottle unless you had the key to the lock. It's a similar type of holder, again, in the 19th century. A real bargain, a beautiful wine holder that he got for six bucks that's worth, wait for it, 300 $300 for a piece of silver plate. So all of you are saying, oh, silver plate's not worth anything. If the item is a particular item, a particular form, silver plate can be valuable too. That's another real bargain. I'm Dr. Lori. If you want to know the real deal about your art, antiques, and collectibles right here on the channel, please share the channel. Don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I'll see you next time. I hope you find your real bargain real soon.